14 prayer times. One of the prayer targets was about the holiness of the Lord. In the scripture in Hebrews, it says, without a holiness, no one will see the Lord. And uh, that we need to be um, focused on the Lord's holiness. And I want us, as we go into worship this morning, to focus on uh, the beauty of God's holiness, the splendor of His majesty. How I many know when we do that, the other things in our mind kind of fade into the, into the light of His glory, amen? amen? And we can get focused on Him. So let's stand this morning and let's, uh, let's, as we pray, maybe there's some things that have happened in your life this week. It happens to all of us where we've allowed the enemy to come in and steal from us or we've had circumstances of life just happen to us. Maybe we need to say, God, cleanse my heart. Amen? God, cleanse my mind. Help me to see you in the beauty of your holiness. Help me to behold you in the splendor of your majesty and not miss anything that God wants to deposit in our hearts this morning. Amen? And as we do that, we can lift holy hands. Amen? We don't have to worry about the dirt of this week. We can lift holy hands and worship him and enter in. So let's do that this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege that we have this morning to come into your throne room, your throne of grace, obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God, we want to worship you in the beauty of your holiness this morning. And God, we're not holy in and of ourselves. We're only holy when we're in Jesus Christ. So God, this morning, forgive us where we failed you this past week. Maybe words that have come out of our mouth that don't represent you well. God, attitudes in our heart, God, that we need forgiveness and cleansing from this morning. Cleanse us this morning because, God, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We want to see you in the beauty of your holiness, the splendor of your majesty. So, God, wash us, cleanse us, help us to be able to lift holy hands, to worship you, and to receive all that you have for us today, all that you want to deposit in our spirits. And, God, we just give you the service, have your way in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.
holy is the Lord. Worship Him this morning. Jesus wants us to be, but it's not about us. It's about what Jesus wants for us. And through him, we have the victory. 
Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. And then we have freedom in Him. Praise the Lord. We learned this song when we were down in Florida. and uh, We sang it a couple weeks ago, maybe new to you. But as you learn it, listen to the words, the powerful words about freedom. And uh, worship with us as you learn it. There's a calm that covers me. It's a place of 
circumstances may not be perfect but God when you're in our circumstances with us God we know there'll be breakthrough we know God that you'll keep us that you'll deliver us that you'll help us God help us to rest in you today God to find that place of freedom God where we know that you're in control you're sovereign Lord hallelujah we thank you Jesus when I survey the wondrous cross
worship you this morning. We thank you for who you are, Jesus, that we can know you personally, Lord Jesus, that we can walk with you, Lord. Hallelujah, we worship you today. God, help us to have our minds on things above, God, things that are going to matter when the trumpet sounds. God, let our minds not be cluttered and frustrated and distracted, God, by the temporary cares and pleasures of this life. But God, let our eyes, let our focus, let our attention be on your majesty, God. How awesome you are. God, let those other things just be lost in the light of your glory. God, as we're in your presence this morning, I pray, God, that we can find healing, Lord God. I pray that we can find, God, deliverance and freedom, God, and breakthrough, Lord Jesus. The power of your Holy Spirit, God, just being poured out in our lives. Hallelujah. Help us to see you in the beauty of your holiness, God. The splendor of your majesty, God, knowing that there's nothing, God, there's nothing that's too difficult for you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you this morning. Have your way in our hearts. God, accept our worship this morning, God, as a sweet sound in your ear. God, I pray it's blessed you. I pray it's put a smile on your face. We ask that you walk among us, God, that you teach us, God, that you draw us closer to you to the remainder of this service. We just give you praise. We give you glory for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. And it's good to see friends today. Hallelujah. Praise God. His presence is here today. How many have sensed a sweet, sweet sense of His presence during worship today? I really have. I believe that God is going to do something good today. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. And I think we ought to be excited. How many know God's not dead? God's alive. And if God's alive, how many believe we ought to be alive in spirit this morning? Can we give him a hand clap of praise? Come on. I believe God wants us to be alive. His presence is going to be alive in the spirit of God. And um, I believe that the Lord wants to do some wonderful, uh, wonderful things in this place today. If we will uh, give him the opportunity. Uh, Pastor Eric, you're a little taller than I am. This morning I woke up and there was a song on my heart and I downloaded it onto my iPhone and while I was getting ready and anticipating a move of the Spirit this morning, I was just singing. Holy Spirit, Lord, rain on our fields. Rain on our fields. Let it rain. Let it rain. Looked out the window. I thought it was spring, and it's snowing in Colorado. I'm telling you, I am from Oklahoma. We call it the bipolar state. I think uh, Colorado runs a second. Uh, <laughs> But God know, how many believe God knows what we have need of in the natural? And how many know that God knows what we have need of in the spiritual? And I pray today that you are going to be blessed. I don't believe that you are here by accident today. I believe that God has brought every person here uh, with a specific purpose of what he wants to accomplish in your life. So, Father, we just pray right now that there would be breakthrough in this house God, we pray right now. Come on, somebody help me pray right now. Just open up your mouth and, and agree with me in prayer right now. Wherever two or three agree as touching any one thing, it shall be done. Father, I'm asking that there would be breakthrough today. Father, I am asking today that there would be encouragement, Lord, released in this place. I'm asking, God, that there would be fresh empowerment, fresh anointing released. God, even those that may watch this video on YouTube, watch this video online. Father, I pray that the anointing of God would go forth from this place. I pray that 
that the anointing of God would touch every life and every hearer today. Lord, touch us by your spirit. Touch us by your power. Touch us by your grace. And God, we will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. How many believe God's going to do something in your life today? Amen? Hallelujah. Come on, I want you to touch three people today and say, God's going to do it today. God's going to mess you up. If you'll let him, God's going to mess you up today. Some of you are not sure what that consists of. It's all good. Come on, tell somebody today, God's got something good for you in this place today. I really believe it. I really believe it. Hallelujah. 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 Pastor Eric, thank you for the opportunity to come and be a part of what God is doing here. I believe the best days are still ahead. Amen. How many know there are some preachers that preach? I mean, it's all gloom and despair and agony on me. I'm telling you what, we're going to go through some hardships, but there's glory at the finish line. Amen. I'm telling you, it's not over until God says it's over, and it's not over, guess what, until we win. Amen. And so we have every reason to be encouraged this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Hebrews? The book of Hebrews chapter 12. I will tell you this. I draw a lot of inspiration from the audience that I am preaching to. So if you will help me preach this morning, I'm Pentecostal. I'm not nervous when somebody shouts amen. Woo, praise amen. Jesus. So I draw a lot of inspiration from the congregation that I'm preaching to. And if folks don't help me preach, I preach a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But when folks help me and say, come on, sis. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's good preaching. Amen. It can be a whole lot shorter. Hallelujah. They're feeling inspired now, Pastor. <laughs> So, uh, I'm not sure if you're with me yet or not, so let's just have a little practice on the count of three. Everybody say amen. 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 Oh, I didn't oh, have to Y'all <laughs> ready? One, two, three. Amen. amen. One, two, three. Amen. amen. Everybody say, that's good preaching, sis. That's, that's good preaching, sis. All right, how many's going to help me preach? Hallelujah. We may be out of here in 20 minutes, and I hope you know I don't mean that at all. <laughs> the book of Hebrews chapter 12. I don't know, I don't believe we're going to have it on the screen, but take your tablet, your phone, the Bible, whatever you have this morning, we're going to look to God's Word. I believe today that God has deposited in my spirit a word of encouragement, but also a word of warning. How many understand not every prophetic word that God gives, because I am preaching a prophetic word today, whether you receive it as one or not. But how many understand many times we can, as ministers, give a prophetic word or we can hear a prophetic word. Sometimes it is a right now word and other times it is a word that is to be put away, remembered for a time that is still yet to come. So I want you to keep that in mind this morning because I do believe the Lord has a word of encouragement, a word of warning, and a prophetic word for the body of Christ this morning. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. For uh, many of us here today, this will be a very familiar passage of Scripture. Scripture says this, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which would so easily entangle or beset us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on who? On Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Aren't you glad it's already finished? Yeah. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary. Amen. Let me say that again. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Father, I thank you today for the opportunity to come. 
Lord, how I love this church. How I love the people, Lord, in this community. Lord, how I love Colorado Springs. Father, I'm believing for a great outpouring. I'm believing, God, for a great revival. Yes. God, today I pray that you would speak a word that will encourage many because, Lord, many of us are going through situations and trials, Lord, that we can't even make sense of. Father, I pray today in the next few moments, Lord, would you please anoint me? Lord, this morning I stand before you and this people, a weak but a willing vessel. So, Lord, I depend upon your anointing. Let your anointing come upon me now. Let your anointing come upon the hearers of your word. Lord, that today we would not just be hearers and go our happy way, but Lord, we would hear the word, receive the word, yes, and become doers of the word of the living God. Thank you for the spirit that I feel now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 On Monday, April 15th, 2013, more than a half million fans, spectators lined up and down the streets of Boston, Massachusetts. As they watched and as they cheered on for more than 26,000 people that had come from all over the world, professionals and amateurs, old, young, from all kinds of backgrounds. They came from all over the world to this place. They had one purpose. They had one goal. And that was to do something historic by running and finishing a grueling 26.2 mile race we know as the Boston Marathon. Over the many years this race has been run it has become symbolic and known as the world's finish line. And yet four hours, nine minutes and 43 seconds into this race at 2.50 p.m. in the afternoon Eastern Time, bombs set by Islamic terrorists went off at the finish line, causing the race to be halted, preventing many from even getting the opportunity to finish the race, leaving three dead, more than 260 injured, many maimed for life. This morning, I want to preach a message that I've entitled, Attack at the Finish Line. Attack at the Finish Line. This morning, I believe there's a prophetic word that the Lord has for His people today. I believe as we look at what happened just about a year ago now in Boston, I believe that there is some spiritual application that we can make in our own lives as well. Perhaps everything is good in your world right now. I hope it is. But I'm telling you, I have never seen a day as an evangelist that's been doing this for 16 years now plus out there traveling every weekend I don't know that I've ever seen a time, Pastor Eric, where I am hearing the stories that I am hearing today. I don't know that I have seen a time when more people are under greater attack. I'm not talking about the attacks of yesteryear. I'm not talking about the trials of yesterday. I'm talking about we have been bumped up to a whole new dimension. The enemy has bumped it up to a whole new level. Is there anybody here today that feels that besides me? Yes. yes. I wish I had time this morning to share some of the stories that I hear as an evangelist. Pastors confide in me. People confide in me. People blow up my Facebook, my email all the time. The needs are just incredible. I, I, I want to say this. We understand that we live in a fallen world. Amen? Amen. And because we live in a fallen world, there is a measure of sin and sickness that's a part of the fallen world. We understand that. But listen to me. When you begin to see patterns 
that go outside of the norm of, well, we just live in a fallen world as long as we're here until Jesus comes back and redeems us all from it. There's going to be some things take place. But when you see things begin to happen that are outside the norm, when you begin to see patterns and being an evangelist and traveling like I do, I see and I have a greater scope and greater understanding of what is happening in the body of Christ, not just one local church, not one local assembly. Are you with me this morning? And I have been seeing patterns. So when I hear within about a three week period of four, not one, not two, not three, four pastor's wives within about a three week period who think they're just going into the doctor's office for their normal checkup and they discover you have stage four cancer. You have a legion on your brain the size of a tennis ball. And when you see this again and again and again, you begin to say, whoa, this is not just we're living in a fallen world and we're going to have to deal with this. How many understand what I'm trying to say? You understand, wait a minute, Satan is aiming at something. Satan has a specific attack. When you begin to see, and I'm not making this up, but when you begin to see not one, not two, not three, not four, but you begin to see and you begin to read stories of pastors even mega church pastors that seem like they've got it all together committing suicide you understand that Satan has released a brand new attack upon the body of Christ now hear me today because I don't want you to think that I am a pessimist by what I'm going to shoot. I said I am bringing you warning, but I'm also bringing you a word of encouragement. So I want us to look at the word of God today because I believe he is going to speak to our hearts in this place. But if we look at what Paul writes to us, first letter to the Corinthians, he writes and he likens our Christian journey to a race that we are running. A race that we are running to finish the course and to obtain the prize. I read in the book of Acts, Luke writes in the book of Acts 2024 20, that his only desire, I love this, I can relate with Luke, that his only desire is to finish the race and complete the task that God has set before him. How many understand that should all be our ultimate aim? Amen. In the text that I read, the writer of the Hebrews most agree is Paul admonishes us to run the race with patience, to run the race with endurance. Why does he exhort us in that way? Because folks, here's a newsflash. If you didn't already know it, you're going to know it in a minute. We're not in a sprint. We are not in a hundred yard dash. How many understand we are in a race that is not for the faint of heart? Amen. We are in a spiritual race that is more like a spiritual marathon. How wonderful, I was thinking how wonderful it would be if we came to the altar, gave our heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, got up from the altar, made a hundred yard dash to the finish line in victory. How many know when you first get saved, God will give you little victories like that to encourage you along the way? How wonderful it would be if that's the way God... Now, if I had been God, that's how I would have done it. How wonderful that would be, but how many have already found out in your spiritual journey that's not how God works? It'd be so wonderful if we could just get up, make a hundred yard dash to victory, and I mean never experience the bumps or the setbacks along the way, but we are in a race 
equal to a spiritual marathon. Let it be clear, our goal this morning is to faithfully finish the course and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Pastor Eric, I'm sure you can relate to this. There's been so many times that I wanted to throw in the towel. There's been so many times I got tired of people. I'm telling you, the ministry would be wonderful if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> I'm not talking about anybody here at finished work. You know, they go to that other church. <laughs> There's been so many times that I wanted to throw in the towel. But the one thing that would always keep me going is to know one day I am going to stand before him and give an account for my works, whether they be good or bad. And more than anything, I want to hear him say, it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what the critics may say, but to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Can somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? I believe that in your desire as well. But Satan has a goal as well. Satan's goal is to do everything in his power to keep us from faithfully finishing the course that God has set before you and I. Now, I believe today, I believe most of you will agree with me on this, but perhaps there are some who will not. And I believe that we're on the home stretch. I believe that Jesus is about to come. I don't know if it will be days, weeks, months, or years, but I'm telling you, we're in the season. Jesus is coming. Amen. Amen. I personally believe I will see the coming of the Lord in my lifetime. Amen. So don't think me a pessimist today, friend, but think me a realist when I tell you that if we really believe that we are on the home stretch, the, the last leg of the race, if we really believe that we are truly getting closer to that blessed promise, to that blessed prize, to that eternal home, guess what? We can expect the enemy to do everything he Power to sabotage our walk, the race, our journey. I'm telling you, I believe the Lord gave me a prophetic word that there will be an attack at the finish line. We can look around even now and see that Satan seems to be pulling out all the stops. How many understand what I mean? I mean, it seems like he is pulling out all the stops. He's on the attack. More and more I read and I hear of preachers. A few years ago, you know, many fell into morality, and I'm sure that's still going on, but I'm hearing more and more of preachers that are falling into heresy. They started off preaching the full gospel. They started off preaching the uncompromising word of God. They were on the path called straight and narrow. But deception suddenly now is creeping into the church. And they are falling into error preaching another gospel. They started the race well, but they have lost their way. It's an attack against the church against God's servants who are mouthpiece for Him. We're seeing attack upon traditional marriage that's been around for millennia. Older an institution, older than the church, we see how traditional marriage is being attacked. We see, basically, I mean, I, I've got a list here that I can name, but basically, let me just suffice and say this. Anything that is good, anything that is holy, it is being attacked by Satan in this hour. Our personal freedoms as Americans yes. under attack. Yes. Christian liberty under attack in America like no other time yes. that we have known in our country's history. Yes. Let there be no misunderstanding. If you this morning are a professing Christian... <laughs> And you have put your hope, your faith, your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? <laughs> Satan isn't just gunning for this church. Satan isn't just gunning for the church down the road. Satan is gunning for you and you and you. Yes. That is the fact of the matter. 
Many are being attacked with physical ailments, financial setback, mental fatigue, maybe perhaps, worst of all, spiritual discouragement. There's a message I preach on the dangers of discouragement. I'm telling you what, if spiritual discouragement isn't taken care of quickly, it opens the door to all kinds of things that the enemy will come in with to destroy our lives. Discouragement is dangerous, friend. But the bottom line is this. The enemy's ultimate goal is the same. Whether, is he, whether he is attacking in the physical realm, in, in, in your health or in your mind or in your finances, uh, wherever he is attacking, his goal is the same he wants to take our faith because how many know if he can take our faith, then guess what? He can take our miracle. That's right. As we get closer to that eternal finish line, I'm telling you, the intensity of these attacks will increase. I believe the Lord showed me something as I thought about what happened in Boston a year ago. I thought about how the terrorists used some very unconventional methods. We have, sad to say this, but we've almost gotten used to the idea of planes flying into buildings. And so we take precaution to try to safeguard in that area. We've gotten used to thinking the enemy may go this direction, the enemy may do this. We have to safeguard against that. But I found something interesting here, and I believe the Holy Spirit illuminated this to me. At that Boston Marathon, those terrorists used some very unconventional methods to set bombs near the finish line. What were they? Pressure cookers? And I felt the Lord was saying to me, in my spirit, I felt the Lord was saying, so it is in this last day, the church is going to face some things that we have never faced before. That the enemy is going, are you hearing me today? Yes. Let me say that, are you hearing the spirit of the Lord today? Yes. That the enemy is going to try some very unconventional ways, things that we have never been attacked with before. Can I just use myself for an illustration? Recently, I was going through a season and uh, before the Lord really began to illuminate this word to me, and then I understand, I understood more of what was going on. But I, I, I began to, uh, how many know the enemy can plant words and thoughts in your mind, and he has a way of sounding just like you? Or you think it's you. And I was going through a season and it's like, my Lord, I'm saved and born again, I think. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Why in the world am I having those thoughts? Why in the world? Now, I know my weaknesses. How many know we always have weaknesses? I know my weaknesses. I know there are certain things that I have to safeguard against. I have to stay away from maybe this thing or this thing. And I sure got to stay away from the refrigerator. Come on, everybody say amen right there. I know my weaknesses. I know I've got to safeguard against them. But all of a sudden... All of these things are coming and it's like, why am I feeling tempted by that? I've never been tempted by that before. Oh, come on, I'm preaching better than y'all shouting this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, why, well, why am I having those thoughts? I, I've never, I've never uh, been tempted to be offended by a brother or sister in Christ before. Why am I dealing? Because the enemy is going to not come the way you've expected him to come. We've got safeguards up there. Guess what? He's going to use some unconventional methods and come through the back door. But the Bible says that he would not have us ignorant of the enemy's devices. How many know the enemy wants us to be, uh, the, the, the Lord wants us to be wise against the enemy's devices in this last day. And if we know what he is doing, if we know what his scheme is, then I believe that we can safeguard against them. Amen. Hebrews 12 gives us words of advice to help us to run the race faithfully, to withstand any attack, to cross 
the finish line and complete the course. Again, let me say in this passage, let me just read it again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that would so easily entangle or beset us and let us run with perseverance, patience, endurance, the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Again, let me say in this passage, Christian life is not compared to a sprint. I don't believe that, but rather to a miracle. Now, I felt really intimidated bringing this message today about running the race and running and some of the things that I'm going to be talking about because I thought, I'm a walker. I don't know anything about running. And here your pastor is a master runner. And I thought, Lord, if I don't get this right, I'm probably going to hear about it later. <laughs> but it seems to me, just in logic, in a sprint, you run as fast as you can for a short distance. So it seems to me, at least, Pastor Eric, that speed would be the critical factor there. Are you with me? Come on. But in a marathon, endurance is the most critical factor. Amen. See, some folk in the church today, they got the zeal to start. But soon after, they run out of steam. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let me just go ahead and preach. Oh, pastor, we're with you. We're praying for revival. We know Colorado Springs needs a revival. We're going to pray. We're going to fast. And they'll stay with you until the second meal of fasting. Oh, Come on. <laughs> and the third prayer meeting. And then you won't see them anymore. I said they've got the zeal to start. But soon after they run out of spiritual steam. Come on. Are you still here this morning? You know, I came across a shocking statistic, and when I was preparing this message, I remembered and I had to go back and research and make sure that my uh, statistics were correct. But a shocking statistic says this, that 80% of seminary and Bible school graduates who enter the ministry, I mean, ready to take the world by storm, ready to do something for Jesus, ready to make an impact upon the world for the glory of the kingdom. 80% of them, when they enter the ministry, will leave the ministry within the first five years. Can I tell you this morning? It doesn't matter how you start. What matters is how you finish. Amen. I mean, some of us, may have absolutely faltered and fallen coming right out of the starting blocks, but it doesn't matter how you start. Pick yourself up by the grace of God. He will cleanse. He will forgive. Come on, somebody help me this morning in this place. It doesn't matter how you start. What matters is how you finish. And there are many in the church world today that started the race but when they encounter, because somebody said, come to Jesus and you'll be a millionaire. Yes. <laughs> because the gospel is all about prosperity, you know. Does God want to prosper us? You bet. There's also a cross to bear to be followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. But see, they only heard one side of it. And so when they started in this race thinking it was going to be a walk through a rose garden, they found out and they encountered the trials, they encountered trials, they found out that much of the course was uphill. Can I have an amen? amen. amen. That there are going to be hurdles and detours along the way and they lost their resolve to finish the race. I want to look quickly at what Paul said to Timothy, his young son in the Lord. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 and 6, he writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. What is he saying here? He is saying, I'm getting close to the finish line. He goes on in verse 7, and he says this, I have fought the good fight. 
How many know there is a good fight Amen. worth fighting? Churches that are fighting over the color of the carpet. <laughs> Churches that are fighting on whether to buy that chandelier because after all, nobody knows how to play it. <laughs> Y'all get that later in the lesson. <laughs> Churches that are fighting over do we sing old songs, new songs? Do we sing off the wall out of the hymnal? I don't have time for that kind of fighting. But Paul says that there is a good fight. That it, Oh, come on, somebody help me preach this morning. That there is a good fight that is worth fighting. He said, I have fought the good fight and I have finished the course. But here's the most important thing. And I've kept the faith. Verse 8. So... Therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Then in verse 9, he's writing to Timothy. Make every effort to come to me soon. Verse 10. For Demas, my ministry companion, my companion in the Lord, Demas, has forsaken me, having loved this present world. What was Paul saying? Paul saying he didn't finish the course. He may have started out well, but he did not finish the course. As I was reading on this, most commentaries, theologians agree that Demas did indeed start well. But as Paul is getting closer to the finish line, and his martyrdom was imminent, that Demas, they agree that Demas did not have the faith or the courage to finish the race. For he feared persecution and he succumbed to the temptation to leave the apostle in order not to hazard his own life or his own personal safety. His motive for leaving Paul seems to be self-preservation and a love for the ease and the comfort and the safety of home. I read somewhere in the book of Revelation where it says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb the word of their testimony we stop there but it goes on to say and they love not their own lives even unto the death and yet Demas seeing Paul's imminent martyrdom fearing for his own life goes back home you can read he goes back to the place that was home. He goes back to the place where he started. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you this morning, in this last day, we have got to determine and we have got to make the determination right now, not when the storms hit. We've got to make the determination right now. I don't know if this is offensive in Colorado, but this is just the way we say it in Oklahoma. Come to hell or high water, no matter what the enemy may throw our way. We have already made our minds up. No matter what the enemy comes against us with, we are going on to victory. We are going to finish the course. Come on, can somebody put your hands together and give it all praise. We've got to decide now. Today is the day. I really believe today is the day of decision because friends, I'm telling you even Last night, God woke me up, and at 6 o'clock, God gave me a dream that was so disturbing. And I mean, I sat straight up in bed, and if you know how much I like to sleep, you would know that's God. <laughs> and I began to write down what the Spirit of the Lord was giving me that was concerning our nation. Storms that were coming. And I believe that it's not going to be very long. I believe there's some things up on the horizon. Folks, we've got to settle it now with God. We used to sing an old song. Though none go with me, still I will follow. It doesn't matter if mama or daddy goes. It doesn't matter if the family wants to get on board. There comes a time you've got to set your face like flint and say, though none go with me, still I will follow. got to keep our eyes upon the goal. Oh, the enemy would like to say, but look here, but look here, but look over here. But we've got to keep our eyes on the goal. Amen. My goal is not to have some big ministry. 
My goal is not to have fancy cars or fancy houses. Nothing wrong with that. God wants to bless his people. My goal is not that my name would be known before men. The goal is I would stand before my Lord having finished the assignment that he entrusted me with. And friends, for me, I'm telling you, I'm not going back. Amen. Have I had plenty of opportunities? You bet. Have I had enough discouragement come against me that I probably had every right to say, God, find somebody else? Yes, I have. But I've made up my mind. I may have to pause and regroup a while. I may have to sit down for a while and catch my spiritual second wind, but no matter what, I'm not going back like Paul. I will say I may not have yet apprehended, but this one thing I do, I press. How many understand that word's an ugly word? To press means you're going to have to press through something. It requires some effort. Like Paul, I say, I may not have it yet, but I am pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God which is in Jesus Christ my Lord I love the old song that we used to sing we still sing it sometimes through many dangers toils and snares I have already come I love this part listen it's his grace that has brought me safe this far if it was in my own power if it was in my own willpower if it was in my own resources toes right now, but it wouldn't be the first time. Just because you were running on a popular highway doesn't mean you're on the right road. So the Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction. Some are going to be turned aside off the narrow path, off the way that they are running that pleases the Lord. They're going to be turned aside off the narrow path in these last days by offense, maybe by their own selfish ambition, maybe persecution. I don't believe we're going to see greater persecution before Jesus comes in the church. Yeah. Maybe disappointments that have come their way that's caused discouragement and even weariness, spiritual weariness, to set in. Many are going to be turned off and it's already happening. Many are going to be turned off the narrow path because they're going to be tripped up by false doctrines while everybody else is on that road. 
That gospel we're hearing today is a message of grace that is not scriptural. Well, because of grace, you know, you can go to the bar and you can drink and you can do this and you can do that. And after all, Pastor Eric, everybody is teaching it. Everybody is preaching it. Everybody is living that way. No, the Bible says broad is the way. Are you hearing me? Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Just because you're on a way that out on a path where everybody else is going the same direction does not mean mean you are on the right path beloved. There are going to be many. They're going to be ensnared by the things of this world while everybody else is sleeping around. Yeah. Come on. God's got it covered. He's got it covered if we come to Him in repentance. That's why Hebrews says, let us throw off everything in ancient times and the ancient Olympians, when they would run, they would run basically naked because they threw off everything that would hinder. The Bible says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin which can so easily entangle. Paul writes this, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do so that after I have preached to others, I don't disqualify myself. Amen. What a word for ministers today. He said, I train. I, I, I tra How many know this flesh likes to eat what it wants to eat? This flesh wants to go where it wants to go. This flesh wants to say what it wants to say. Oh, man. Yes. That's right. He said, I train this flesh. I bring it under submission. Can I preach this morning? Or are y'all ready Amen. to be close? Good preaching. Amen. Because you know, Hallelujah. pastors, they love everybody. But evangelists, they come in and just stir up a mess. And then the pastor has to love everybody back afterwards. I mean, no, that's the gift of the evangelist. But it's always amazed me, Pastor, how many people want to lay out of church. How many people, now I know y'all are here today, so I'm not preaching. So buy the tape and give it to those that aren't here today. Yes. Amen. Uh, how many people lay out of church, they'll be derelict with the basics of spiritual discipline of reading the word Praying, being in the presence of God. And I've heard people say, well, you know, if I miss the rapture, they know enough about the Bible. You know, I'll go through the tribulation and then the second coming, I'll get on board. If I miss the rapture, I'll just, you know, I'll make it go seven years. Can I tell you what I think about that stupid, stupid, stupid? <laughs> Amen. Let me understand. If somebody can't live for the Lord... While the church is still here, while there is gospel preaching 24-7 on television, a church on every corner, friends and the body of Christ here to encourage us and pray for us. How many know if we can't live for God now, it's going to be a hard, hard road for those that are left behind. Yeah. Hebrews says, we have right now, we have a cloud of witnesses in heaven that are cheering us on. We have believers that are cheering us on, even from the grandstands of heaven. That brings comfort to me. Yeah. Notice what God gives us, and I'm going to wrap this up. Notice what God gives us to help us faithfully finish the race. Chapter 12 begins with the word, therefore, that is a connector that connects us to the previous Chapter In chapter 11, the writer, probably Paul, gives a long list of people who went through all kinds of testing, but they were found faithful. It speaks of Noah. It speaks of Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, and so many others. There is a great cloud of witnesses that are gathered to cheer us on. Friends, this morning, if we can hear their stories whisper in our spiritual ears when we become discouraged, I believe they are saying, don't give up, don't lose heart, don't quit whatever you do. It will be worth it. It will be worth it. It will be worth it in the end. Hebrews tells us to be inspired by those that have gone before, number one. 
Secondly, the text tells us to be prepared for the struggles that will come. His advice is to throw off everything that would hinder. Today, so many people are encumbered. Today, so many people are hindered. They can't even make it to the house of God. They can't make it to a prayer meeting. They can't make it to things spiritual. They're so encumbered. With the things of the world. Can I just say this boldly? If we are at the same place right now as we were a year ago, I dare say in our lives there should be something that should be thrown off this morning. I said if we're at the same place with God as we were a year ago today, there should be some things that we need to throw off. Amen. Lay aside so that we can run without hindrance. Run without being encumbered. Thirdly, he says, no matter what, whether it be disappointment, disillusionment, hurt, betrayal, sickness, an evil report, whatever it might be, he says, keep your eyes on Jesus. For how many know folk will let you down, the church will let you down, sooner or later the pastor, the evangelist, your best girlfriend, family will let you down. Yeah. But Jesus is faithful. You give me five more minutes. Tell me, give me five oh, more minutes. Amen. Five, ten, fifteen. I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> Two more hours. <laughs> That's coming from somebody that loves me. <laughs> now, Pastor Eric, you can correct me, but please wait till we get home. <laughs> marathon runners, I, I did some study on this. Marathon runners say that there are two critical times in a race. They say the first is at the beginning. I mean, they have trained for it. I mean, the, the adrenaline is running. I mean, they've trained sometimes for years for this moment. I mean, the adrenaline is running. They're ready to run this race. And they say, supposedly, the temptation is to run too fast, too soon, to expend too much energy until they don't have enough left for the end of the race. I talked about some Christians that have done that. They started out with great promise, but they didn't have enough to finish. But they also say, supposedly, that the second critical time in a marathon is at the halfway point. Because you suddenly realize, hey, I've got as far to go as what I just came from. And supposedly they call it, and I don't know if this is correct or not, but supposedly they call this hitting the wall. Where you come to the end of your endurance, and I mean, you've got to reach down deep. You're not sure if you've got enough to finish the rest of the race. I want to make this applicable to us today because I believe this is where a lot of Christians are living. I believe there's a I mean, I'm talking about seasoned saints that are falling away in this hour because they know, my God, how much fasting it took, how much praying it took, the warfare that I've already come through to get to this point, and now there's still greater battle before me. Is this speaking to anybody? Lord, am I going to have what it takes? Shouldn't this thing get easier instead of harder? Lord, do I have what it's... I don't believe there are many Christians right now I talk to them every day that are hitting the wall. Some of them are throwing in the towel. Some of them are barely hanging in the race. I wish I could tell you some stories this morning that would break your heart as it's breaking mine. People even in ministry. If that's happening to people in ministry, how much more is it happening to the laity. Daniel 7 gives us some insight. Though. I believe Daniel 7 gives us one of Satan's greatest end time strategies. And the Bible says this. He, speaking of the devil, in the end of time before Christ returns and all is fulfilled, the devil will make insults and accusations against the Most High God, and then it goes on to say, and he will seek to wear out the saints of the Most High God. That spoke to me when I found that. I believe that's where many of us are today. 
1952. And I want you to get that video ready in just a moment, sweetie, if you will. In 1952, there was a lady, a young lady by the name of Florence Chadwick. She attempted to, to swim the chilly ocean waters between Catalina Island and the California shoreline. And story says that she swam through, I mean, horrible, horrible conditions. She was in a race trying to break a record on this day, and yet conditions were horrible. The weather was foggy. The visibility was just almost at zero. The, the waters she was swimming in were, were chopping, were, were choppy, causing her to just grow exhausted in, in the waters. Story says that her muscles began to cramp up on her, and as her body begins to grow fatigue, so did her resolve. Her resolve begins to weaken. Story said that she absolutely begged to be taken out of the water. Her mother that was in the little boat that had uh, some of her team beside her, in the little boat beside her, they were cheering her on, and her mother said, come on, baby, you can make it. Come on, don't give up, Lawrence. Come on, come on, come on. You can make it. She kept swimming, kept swimming, till finally she, because of the conditions, the conditions were so horrific that she just grew so exhausted that she gave up, and they lifted those that were in the little boat beside her, lifted her lifeless body out of the water and into the boat. And story said, Almost immediately, that when they got her out of the water and into the boat, all of a sudden, the water that had been so choppy for more than 15 hours that she had swam in, all of a sudden became as still as could be. And all of a sudden, the visibility that had been almost at zero, the fog started lifting and the sun broke through. And all of a sudden, she could see that she was literally only a few strokes away from the finish line. And when she got back to the shoreline, she said at a press conference as they were interviewing her, with tears streaming down her face with so much regret, she said, it was the fog. She said, I, I, I think, no, I know, I know if I could have just seen the finish line, I know I could have gone further. If I could have just seen the finish line, I know I could have finished the course. Friends, can I tell you, is it all right that I've just encouraged you in the Lord this morning? Don't be fooled by the fog because the enemy will put fog in front of us on every side. Come on, somebody help me. Don't be fooled by it, friend. I'm telling you, right now we see through a, a glass darkly, but one day we will understand and we will see all this for what it really was and it will not count for anything when we understand it better by and by hear me don't be fooled by the fog I'm telling you because I, I believe that the finish line is closer than what we even realize today today is not the time to lose heart today is not the time to grow complacent oh did you hear me today is the day to be more on fire for God than we have ever been before to do more for God than we have ever done before Monica sweetie do you have that ready I want to close with this video this is a powerful example. Thank you. 
today, I pray that it has. Oh, yes. How many know we're all going to suffer setbacks? But we've got to keep on. Yesterday I had the opportunity to go on what I thought was going to be a nice little nature walk. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya said we're going to take a little walk. I said a little walk, that sounds nice. And uh, Eric and Monica, they're, they're, they're going to run. And so I pictured, I'm not kidding, I pictured in my mind while you all were running and sweating that we were going to just walk around some, uh, some playground uh, equipment. <laughs> I didn't realize that I'd been drafted to take a 4.2 walk. <laughs> You've got to understand, I'm not in the best shape. <laughs> if I had known... I'd have probably said, I, I can't do that. I, I can't finish that. <laughs> How many know when God calls us to do something, he doesn't show us all of the picture or there wouldn't be anybody signing up and say, yeah, right. Amen. Amen. That's right. We got about halfway through. <laughs> Pastor Eric and Monica were running, so they were way ahead. Tommy and I and the two little girls were walking and the youngest daughter you have grew very weary. <laughs> I can't make it, Mom. I can't make it. Yeah, you can. No, I can't. I can't make it. Yeah, you can, baby. Come on. Come on. Come on. And I, I was praying about this message today, and it, I, I just saw something through that child. It took a lot of encouragement from time to time, but she kept pressing through. But you know what? We came to a point on the trail, and there was a sign, and it says, you are here. <laughs> and then we looked. The parking lot is here. Man, we on the way now. Come on. <laughs> and this is what I felt like the Lord said. There's going to be an attack at the finish line. The enemy is going to hit the body of Christ with everything that he has. Oh, but Brother Fred, we got the map. See, I'm about to shout. I'm about to get Pentecostal all over this place right now. I said, we got the map. Amen. And how many know the enemy may hit us for a while, but how many know we see the dots connecting, the prophetic yeah. dots connecting oh, yeah. like never before. Yeah. And I don't know about you. There's going to be some that do fall away, but there is still a remnant that is going to finish the course. And when we yeah. see where we are, and we see, I said I'm about to get Pentecostal, when we see where we are and we see where the finish line is, I believe we're not going to just cross just by the skin of our teeth. I believe we're going to get a second win by the Holy Ghost. You know what? That little girl that was saying, I can't do it, Mama. I can't do it. When she realized how close she was, she ran the rest of the way and finished that walk running to the finish line. I believe that's what the Lord wants for His people. Come on, lift your hands right now. Father, I pray that the wind of the Holy Ghost would blow through this place right now. Come on, somebody pray in the Holy Ghost if you're filled with that prayer language. God, I pray, and Lord, I pray for this pastor. I pray, Lord, for a fresh wind of the Holy Ghost to blow upon him, to blow within him today. I pray, God, that we would catch our second wind. Father, you know what I've been facing in these last few weeks. Lord, I need to catch my second wind, Lord, so that I can continue, but continue faithful.
thankfully, God. Lord, we don't want to just be sitting, Lord, in the grandstands watching others. Lord, we want to be in the race. Oh, God, I pray today every person under the sound of my voice, they have not come here by accident. Lord, I believe they have come here to have a divine encounter with you. And I pray, Spirit of God, now blow into them. I pray infuse, Lord, a fresh empowerment, a fresh anointing. Come on, church, lift your hands and receive it right now. Wind of God, I pray, begin to blow in this room. Come on, if you're feeling the Holy Ghost, begin to pray. Oh, building up ourselves on our most holy faith, pray in the Holy Ghost. Father, I thank you we're not going down. Lord, you said there will be a great falling away, but Lord, you've always had a remnant. You always will have a remnant. Lord, there's some people here this morning that's a part of that holy remnant, and Lord, we're not going to cave in. We're not going to give up. We're not going to run out of steam because, Lord, we're not doing it in the power of our own strength. We're not doing it, Lord, in the power of our own willpower, but Lord, we're doing it by your grace. We're doing it with your strength. So pray, God, right now, breathe upon us, refresh us, revive us, God, for the hour is late. Come on, let's worship him right now. Lord, I love, I love you today, Jesus. Oh, God, where would I be? God, I would have already thrown in the towel a million times if it hadn't been for you. Lord, you know how to come along just at the right time to give a word of encouragement. Oh, God, you know how to show up, Lord. You're an on-time God. Lord, when we think that, Lord, you've already forgotten, God, you show up right on time and remind us of your faithfulness. God, I thank you that even your word says that when we are faithless, you remain faithful. God, you are faithful to see us through. God, we worship you today. We worship you today. I want to give the opportunity. Monica, if you've got something to play, just play whatever you have. If there's anybody here today and you, you say, Renee, I, just, I want special prayer. I just want hands laid upon me. I want somebody to come into agreement with, with me. We, just, we want to give you that opportunity. There's no pressure. Because I believe the Lord is. How many have felt the touch of God just where you have been seated? I'm telling you, that's what we want. I mean, that, that no minister would get the glory that God would just come down and breathe upon us Himself. But if there's anybody here today that has a special need, you want special prayer, we don't want to dismiss without giving you that opportunity. Is there anybody? Is there anybody? Come on. Come on. Don't wait on anybody else. If you want prayer, Come on. Those that are still in your pew, would you just continue to worship and just bring the music up a little bit if you Share God, come on, stretch, stretch your hand this direction. Lord, your anointing is in this room right now. God, I'm expecting, I'm expecting people to walk out of this place differently than the way. Devil, you hear me. I said I'm expecting people to walk out differently than the way they came in in the name of Jesus. Pastor, would you stand behind her? Anointing, a fresh empowerment, a fresh ability, a fresh 
Breathe upon us. God, breathe upon us. 